And it looks like we have some folks who are still filtering in. So that's perfect. Okay. Well, as the other folks start uh, signing in, I'll go ahead and say good morning to everybody. Welcome or good afternoon, depending on where you are. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us for this 30 West IP webcast update. Uh, today is January uh, 4th already, January 4th, 2023. So uh, if you're watching this at a later date, then as always, this information might have changed. What we're going to talk about today is, is, is kind of a memory refresher for you on oceanic reroutes. This still happens to be one of the key areas where we tend to make input errors and we make re, uh, uh, flight plan input errors into our FMS is when we receive these oceanic reroutes. So we wanted to address this at the start of the year to kind of refresh you on that. Now, as always, when we go through our discussion, uh, we, we do give you the opportunity to send us questions in the Q&A panel. Uh, as far as audio settings go, you're more than welcome to adjust your speakers. You have the controls to do that. If you're not hearing us, please make sure you check all of your hardware stuff before you send us a question or, or a statement saying you're not getting anything. Uh, we can try to help you out when we, uh, if we can see that there is a problem on our end, but otherwise it's, it's usually a connection issue. Now, as far as sending chat or the raise hand symbol, we would ask that you refrain from doing that. We would like for you to, instead of sending questions via chat, just send them through the Q&A panel. And our intention is to answer all these questions at the end of the presentation uh, in one collective Q&A session. So that's what we'll ask you to do is to send the questions to us in that Q&A panel. And then as we go through those answers later on, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll obviously go through them in order and, and get to your your questions in turn, and feel free to upvote questions to make them go to the top, whatever the case might be. Now, as far as nonverbal feedback, that's available. If you guys want to feel free to use that, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, just keep in mind, if you do the hand raise or anything like that for a question, we're going to ask that you write that question in the Q&A panel so that we can read it for the entire benefit of the entire group and for our recording. Now, if you have multiple devices, you're more than welcome to log in on multiple devices. We, we just showed you the controls for a laptop. If you're using an iPad, you can see those are the exact same. So there's really nothing different there. Uh, so you have the same functionality. Now, before I move into the, or we let Mitch take us into the topic of conversation, I will go ahead and let you know we're going to turn off our cameras basically to preserve our bandwidth, but we'll still be here to answer your questions. And at the end of the session, that's when we'll take up all the questions in a live fashion. All right. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and turn off my camera and Mitch got his off. He's got his off as well. So we'll get into it. Thank you, Joe. And thank you for everybody who's with us today. This is one of the webcasts that we have developed in response to comments from users. During our last webcast, this was brought up and uh, we're simply responding to it. We're excited about it and we hope you find value with it. So let's move into the topic, oceanic reroutes. While an oceanic reroute can occur anywhere, just like a domestic reroute can occur anywhere, the most likely application of it would be the North Atlantic. And that is simply because the North Atlantic currently does airborne clearances prior to entering their airspace. They can be done via voice, um, some cases VHF, some cases uh, HF, some cases uh, ACARS, as you see here. And that increases the likelihood. So we're going to use that as a launching point for this discussion. But remember, even though I'm showing it in ACARS, it could be done via voice and it could be done in other regions as well. So in this particular instance, the format that is used by the North Atlantic Flight Information Regions instructs thus that a uh, reroute is part of the clearance, therefore informing us that we need to read it carefully. We've highlighted that in red. It wouldn't be in red, obviously, on your screen. And then we have down below it the points that have changed in red. Obviously, if it weren't highlighted, it could be missed. And that's, that's one of the things that we want to talk about. And when that reroute occurs, their expectation is this clearance, this new revised reclearance would require you to change the route. And there are three elements of it that are very important. And we're going to look at those elements and kind of break this apart, deconstruct it, if you will. So before we get into the weeds, what we'd like to do is to get a little feedback from you so that everyone here can get an appreciation for how many people this affects. So our question to you is, have you ever received an oceanic 
reroute. All right, give me one second here. I'm trying to find that poll for you. So here we go. I'm going to launch a poll on your screen, and this is going to be your chance. I appreciate all the nonverbals. That's awesome. Uh, but I'm going to launch a poll now, and we're going to ask that you answer this question via the poll. But thank you guys very much for all the replies. Uh, my apologies, I didn't make it clear enough. Yeah, so there's I'm two questions, and they should appear in the same box. There we go. Good. So if you guys have a moment, or if you can, if you don't mind, resend that to us. I'd appreciate it. I do see some hands up as well. So if you have those hands up for questions, or if you were just replying to our previous question, I'll ask you to go ahead and put those back down. And if you do have a question, feel free to type it in. We've got some answers still rolling in pretty quickly as well. So I'm going to go ahead and continue to leave this open for now. Yeah, Joe, we've got... um. We have 184 people attending and we've received 136 answers. So let's just wait just a little bit, see if we have any more feedback. Perfect. Sounds good. We're almost at a solid minute. So I'll give it at least a, a minute and 15. Still have some folks rolling in on the answers. All right. Answer input has seems to, it, it's still going slowly, but there's a minute and 15 seconds. So what I'm going to do in the interest of time is I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the poll questions at this time, and we'll share the results. So have you ever been issued an oceanic reroute? Most of us say yes. Uh, in fact, 79% uh, of the group of the respondents agreed yes. That's not surprising. We seem to get those, uh, not terribly frequently, but it's not uncommon. Now, if you answered yes, who filed the flight plan? And the majority, uh, uh, the 40% of our choices, uh, our selections was universal weather and flight planning with Airing Direct coming in second at 21%. Uh, and then we had the Department Operations Group at 9%. So it looks like, oh, then International Trip Planning Services is at five. So for the most part, it looks like you guys are using a trip planning service and not doing it too much on your own. And I think that represents the dominant um, uh, role that those two, uh, Universal and Air Rank, play in the industry. That I, I don't believe that that would indicate that they're more prone to reroutes. I think that's just they're more commonly used. Excellent. All right. Well, I will stop sharing that. Thank you guys for taking the time to answer that poll. We do have another question we're going to submit to you in a few more minutes, and it'll be similarly answered where we'll just launch a poll. Uh, but for now, I will go ahead and turn it back over to Mitch. Let's talk about why this topic is so important. So what we're going to do in the initial step is look at Advisory Circular 9170 Bravo, and this is the document the FAA publishes for oceanic and remote operations. And in it, it discusses in Appendix D a reclearance, or what I have referred to as a reroute. And it states that the number one scenario that leads to pilot deviation from the assigned routing is a reclearance. Now, many of you, if not all, are very familiar with this. Um, reroutes are the leading cause of navigational errors. And it states it quite clearly here, and this is something that occurs year after year. But we can do a little better than this. This circular does a great job of, of pointing that out. But let's go beyond this and look at what the actual facts show for 2021. Each year, the North Atlantic Systems Planning Group task an agency called the North Atlantic Scrutiny Group to analyze errors in the North Atlantic. And, and we often use this information, and I, I've said this so many times before, because it's one of the most accurate data sets. They do such a wonderful job of collating the data, analyzing it, and then, of course, providing it to us as an industry. So here is the 2022 edition that looks at the 2021 issues that we should be concerned about. So this is real life, real time. Here we see a list of the errors that they use to categorize the loss of separation and the compromise of safety within the North Atlantic. And as you can see here, 
there are two that stand out at the top. Obviously, far and away, the greatest risk lies with the crew flight plan versus clearance, and the crew did not adhere to clearance. And both of these have in their very title and definition the clearance and the misunderstanding of a clearance. So flight plan versus clearance. That would be where somebody got a reroute like I just showed you, and it wasn't highlighted in red, and they didn't discern that it was a reroute, and they flew what they had loaded from their packet and not what the clearance said. The second one is there's perhaps a waypoint insertion error or several common reasons why the route is incorrect. They're both red, and that is because they are crew-related. These are errors that the crew commits. So in support of the advisory circular, which said that the reroute was the number one cause of errors, we see current data saying, yes, this is in fact true in 2021, and these two were the leading cause of errors in the previous years as well. So that's why we want to have this conversation. Let's put ourselves in the picture here. We're in an aircraft. We're looking at the MCDU. We receive a clearance from Gander. We're eastbound. We see the route on the North Atlantic planning chart here. And what's different about this clearance? Now, obviously, I've helped you out because this is the same clearance that I showed you earlier. But without the red highlighting, it wouldn't be too difficult to look at this and say, well, November 1, 2, 3, cleared to Luton, uh, Jopi. 49 north, 050 west, 51 north, 040 west, 53 north, 030. Yeah, that's right. That's what we did. It takes a thorough set of procedures to be able to commit to routinely examining each of these waypoints and discerning that this is, in fact, different until such time as they come up with a different system. Obviously, a great system would be to highlight it in red to change the color of that text, but they don't have the technology for that right now. And we're using it just to illustrate how important it is to get into the weeds and look at the details. Once we receive a reclearance, there are three critical tasks that need to be completed. And that's really the body of what this discussion is going to be. And the first one would be where we look at the FMC or the FMS and we reprogram the MCDU to reflect the new clearance. Now it's vital that we use the clearance to reprogram the FMC uh, as opposed to, let me give you an example, I take that clearance and I write it on a piece of paper and then I take that piece of paper and I use it to amend the FMS. Take it from the original source and that helps to eliminate error. So step one is to correct the navigation system to make sure the airplane is going to comply with the new system. The second critical step is to correct the plotting chart. The plotting chart could be done electronically. We've talked extensively about that in previous webcasts. There are ways that this can be done in multiple fashions. Using a paper chart, though, I have taken and I've, I, I've done a strikeout on the route and added the new route. I added it in a different color. It doesn't have to be that way. But this is acceptable. It says that in the advisory circular that you can use strikeout. Uh, you could make a new chart. So you have a couple choices, but you do need to correct how you're plotting the root. The third critical task is to correct the master document. Now many of us refer to the master document as a computerized flight plan. The difference between a master document and a computerized flight plan is there may be two or three versions of the same computerized flight plan on the flight deck, but only one of them contains the annotations that will meet the SOP requirements and be retained for six months. So on the left, you see the flight plan, and on the right, you see the clearance. And once again, this is the third time we've used the actual clearance to make the correction, not the FMS to correct the flight plan, the actual clearance. And we've gone and we've changed the waypoint name to reflect the current waypoint name in the reclearance, and we have changed the lat long to reflect it. We've changed the waypoint name for the final point. So a reroute can be the entire route. It can be the entire route in an altitude, uh, altitude and speed. Uh, typically, though, in the North Atlantic, most reroutes are only going to involve one or two waypoints. There are opportunities for you to have to do an entire reroute. But most of them are one or two waypoints, and that's what we're going to show you here. In the execution of this third critical task, remember, we've done the FMS, the plotting chart, and now we're doing the master document. 
we are required to revalidate the mag course and the distance for the two new legs to ensure that the route that is in the FMS is correct. Now, I'm showing you the FMS and I'm showing you the mag course and distance. It's pretty easy to put it in there. It'll derive the mag course and distance, but we are not to accept that as the final step. We have to go back and independently validate that. Now, I'm going to show you what the requirement for that is, where the requirement for that lies, and how to do it quite simply. This is often overlooked. And this was the impetus for this webcast. During the previous webcast, we had a subject matter expert who is vastly more experienced, vastly more knowledgeable than I am, uh, make the comment that this step is often left out and that it's a critical step. It is also part of any FAA validation tabletop where you're going to sit down and they're going to say, okay, you have a reroute, here's a couple new points, what's the mag course and distance? So this is something that we teach during the initial and it's something that we should all be able to do without hesitation. Again, returning to the advisory circular 9170 Bravo, we're going to use this as a reference for the requirement to perform this task. Again, we're going to return to Appendix D, and it states in this particular paragraph that you should check the MAC course and distance between the new waypoints to update the master document course and distance. That's literally just what I showed you on the previous slide. So we're instructed here that this is a step that is part of our reclearance process. We could do this in three ways. Just like there are three critical tasks, the final task can be done in three different manners. So let's break that out. Let's kind of deconstruct that. The first one is we could obtain from dispatch an updated master document and check that against the FMS. So again, it's got to be checked to validate, to confirm, if you will, the FMS. So if you have internet connectivity, you could contact a flight planning service and they could provide you with a new flight plan. Or you could perhaps even compute a new segment on that flight planning service and derive this information. And then that would be a way of doing it the most accurately. Obviously, if you've got an entirely new flight plan and updated your ETPs and everything, that would be the most accurate way to do that. But not everybody has internet access and not everybody has a flight plan service provider who can perform this function um, successfully. So this is step one. Get a new flight plan if you can. They mentioned dispatch because the airlines have a dispatch. Here we see a new master document. This is precisely what the goal was. Now, over here on the left, instead of having 54 North 020 West, it's been amended. It says 55 North 020 West. So it's the new waypoint, the new MAC course and distance. The, instead of Dogal, it's Resno, and it has the new MAC course and distance. I could have this sent to me digitally. Uh, I could print it in the cockpit, but I, I really wouldn't need to. I could have it on an iPad, and I could be doing this electronically. So uh, in any case, I would be able to get a new document and that would be the most accurate way to do it. So that is the first version of the third critical step to get a new document. Returning, uh, another way, a second way of determining the MAC course and distance and updating the master document with that course and distance would be to use an onboard flight planning system to independently calculate the course and distance and check that against the FMS. During the conduct of most of my career, almost all of it, we did not have a mechanism for this. So what we have today is extraordinary in terms of power, reach, and capability. And we want to take a look at that because most of you will have an onboard flight planning system available to you that can quite easily and accurately perform this function. And that would be ForeFlight. If I go into ForeFlight and I place my amended route in, as you see reflected here with 55 North 020 West and Resno, that gives me the capability to validate the MAG course and distance quite easily. So let's take just a, a second and look at that. It's as simple as this. I take my finger and I touch a specific leg lightly in the center. It highlights that leg and then the leg produces 
an explanation of the waypoints the legs involved in and the mag course and distance. And that could be used to update my master document. Very, very simple and accurate. Here again, we see the subsequent leg from 55 North 020 West to Resno, and the leg is defined, and the mag course and distance is illustrated as you see here. Now we can take that information from ForeFlight and we can place it on our master document as illustrated on the left here in red. Now obviously it's just in red to highlight that, but we've taken the map course and distance from that independent flight planning provider and we're comparing it to what the FMS has calculated. And when they match, what we now know is that we have a confirmation that the FMS did the right thing. Again, a required step as we saw in the advisory circular. The third method is the one that was mentioned by the subject matter expert in our previous webcast. And this method to derive the new MAC course and distance and to update the master document uses commercially available tables. And you use those tables to derive the mag course and distance, and then you check that against the FMS. Often you'll hear these referred to as track and distance tables. So this is time for another question. Do you have track and distance tables available to you in your aircraft? Now again, I when will... you operate. Oh, sorry to interrupt you there. My apologies. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll and uh, we'll we'll get you guys uh, another answer for us, if you don't mind. So let me grab that and launch it. We have a pretty good uh, rapid response so far. Yeah, that's a great response. Yeah, and it's we've gotten more than pre previous, and actually we had more people logged in at this one too. So far, it's looking like a pretty even split, which is not terribly surprising based on our experience. Um, it looks like it's slowing down a pretty good bit. I'm going to go ahead and give this one a solid minute, though. We gave the other one about a minute 20, uh, but I think most everybody's answered at this point. It's looking like the answers have slowed down. All right. Okay, there's a solid minute. I'm going to go ahead and end that poll, and we will launch the results for you. So do you have track and distance tables available? 30, uh, almost a third, almost evenly split. A third says yes, a third says no, and a third says not sure. And, and you know, Mitch, I think you agree, based on our experience with, with our classes, that's not terribly surprising. A lot of folks are not realizing they have access to these track and distance tables pretty easily. Right. And that gives us a chance to address the comment that was made during the last webcast. And uh, here on this webcast, go ahead and show everybody where they are and how they work. Excellent. All right. Well, that being said, then I'll, I'll stop talking and I'll let Mitch take over. Now, my bet is whether you know it or not, Almost everybody out there has a set of track and distance tables available to them. If you are involved in a Jepson contract, and you could be using it through JepFD Pro, or you could be using it through ForeFlight, here we show ForeFlight, you'll have access to airway manuals. And of course, depending upon the regions in which you've subscribed, you should have the various seven individual regions, but the general airway manual is common to all, and the general airway manual is where we find a pair of track and distance tables. Now, Joe and I in the course of training talk about how to manipulate for flight and how to bring this information up and, and to find it, so I'm just going to go right into the general airway manual, and I'm going to show you in the table of contents where it identifies what it refers to as true track tables, and it talks about the Northern Hemisphere initial true track and distance tables. And we're going to 
take a look at those because that's really the third method of accomplishing that third critical step, getting the MAC course in distance. And this is the one that you can always fall back on if you have Jepson. And there are other track and distance tables. I'll just say that for a moment. At ATI, we had track and distance tables that we published. They were different than this. Um, they used mid-course. This uses the, as it states here, the initial true track. And I'll talk about that and why that's different. But this is what we're going to use for the resource because it's the one that almost everybody here is going to have available to them at any point in time in a flight if they're using an electronic flight bag or if you're, even if you're using the paper jeps and documents. Selecting the true track tables from the table of contents allows us to look at these North Atlantic crossing track and distances and in the abbreviations it gives us a set of instructions that kind of qualify that this is the initial true track between waypoint one and waypoint two and it does that both eastbound and westbound, which is important and we'll talk about. Now, the reason it's important to highlight that it's the initial true track is two-part. One, it is not the midpoint. There is a midpoint track and distance table, and this is not it. This is the initial true track, track and table. This. The second is that this is the true track. All track and distance tables give you true track. We need the magnetic course. Now, the terminology varies here. I would prefer if they would call this the true course tables. And we take the true course, we use the mag variation to come up with the mag course. However, they're using true track here, and um, the track and distance tables includes the term track we use in the advisory circular and in our vernacular uh, course, but that would be the same thing. So here we define this, and the initial true track is the departure point, the departure course, and we're going we're gonna to break that out. These tables only use latitudes, from latitude to a latitude. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over that extensively because it can be a little bit confusing. Longitude is considered by default to be those waypoints that are separated either by a named waypoint or in the other track and distance tables I'll show you in a moment by 10 degrees of longitude. So longitude is in the default. I'm going to take my departure latitude and my destination latitude and that will provide me the information I need. It's a little bit tricky uh, to get your head around so we'll kind of touch on that. When I successfully drive the MAC course and distance from these track and distance tables, once again, I can place it into the flight plan as shown here in red, as you saw earlier. And this time it simply comes from track and distance tables and I can use it to confirm the FMS. Returning to the advisory circular in Appendix D, the next paragraph states that a discrepancy of more than two degrees may be caused by incompatible mag variation applied in the master document. So we're going to be trying to confirm that our mag course and distance validates and confirms what the FMS has computed, but the truth is the table, the computerized flight plan, a particular chart, or the FMS could be using different mag variation tables based on different dates. And they change, and they change rather frequently in uh, recent experience. So we like to say that it should be within two degrees, but there are exceptions to that, and we're going to explore that. Master documents should list courses, and, and note here they're talking about courses, and then they're talking about tracks. Courses is what's termed in the advisory circular, and we prefer but it was tracks in the Jepson. Uh, master documents should list courses based on the initial mag variation to ensure the validity of the check. Now, it says initial variation. That's also what Jepson said. It's the initial great circle true track. So we're getting a consistent outcome by using the initial. And you should, we should, recheck and verify when we're done that any difference outside of two degrees or two nautical miles would be explored 
and we would give it a lot more scrutiny because if it's more than two degrees or two miles, it could in fact be wrong. But let me just suggest the plus or minus two miles is very critical. It's a matter of trigonometry. It can't really vary more than two miles without um, a very, very high probability of an error. But the plus or minus two degrees, because of recent changes in mag variation and where you are in the world, could be as much as three or four degrees. Uh, so let's take a look at that. In our previous examples, on the flight plan, I showed 079 for 373 miles for our, our new leg. And on the previous FMS, I showed 079 for 373. It really won't often be that way. It, it could be like we see here, uh, 079 for 373. I'm confirming it. It says 083 for 375. There's a two mile error difference and there is a four degree difference. That'd be about as much as you'd want to see. If you saw more, you'd simply break out the lat longs and try to ensure that the lat longs are correct to make sure you've got the correct leg. It's as simple as that. The second leg is 097 for 173. And again, you see it's 100 for 173. So it's three degrees different. A lot of reasons could make that mag variation different. So you could see it, but the mileage should be within two degrees. And we really shouldn't see the mag variation very more than um, three or four. But there are cases where it could be as much as five and six. And, and those are outliers, but they do occur. So if you see five or six, I'd verify those waypoints. But that just could be because the mag variation tables are different. You're a, a northern latitude in certain areas where there's a, a large variation. Jepson says that it's using the initial great circle true track. So let's look at this globe and talk about what great circle routes are. And, and again, I'm sure all of you are, are familiar. Before we had the ability to use computers and iPads and things of that nature, when we got a route, we would take a globe and we would uh, take a plotting tool and go from a departure point, let's say London to Singapore, and we would run it along a globe to see what the Great Circle Route is because that was simple, it was quick, and the the marking tool would often have nautical miles so we could determine if we needed to stop somewhere, perhaps uh, Astana or, you know, something for gas uh, at a midpoint. But this is an illustration of a great circle route using a globe. Today we can do this on uh, iPads and um, various computer programs and uh, it can be done quite easily. But the great circle route isn't the way it always appears on a map. Most of us in aviation have seen maps like this. This is a National Geographic world political map. And we had this as literally as wallpaper on our op center when I was uh, flying. And I have a, a, a very, very large copy in my dining room that uh, not everybody loves. But uh, this allows us to look around the world and see where various countries are and uh, what the boundaries are around those countries. But this isn't an aviation tool. And so let's blow it up and take a look at that, just kind of make an illustration. The design of this map is a Mercator map. And if I were to blow it up and I were to say, I'm going to leave New York and I'm going to go to London, look at the line. The line doesn't even take me into Canada. So it's not in the least bit accurate. It is a nice way to represent things proportionately on a wall, but it's not something we can use in aviation. So this is one of a number of different types of map, but not suitable for us. When we're going to use a map for aviation and we're going to try to get map course and distances, what we are going to require is called a conformal planning chart, a Lambert conformal map. And it's a projection map. It, the, the longitudes are closer at the top and they're farther apart at the bottom. And by creating that spatial projection, you can draw a line, as you see here, from New York to London. And it goes right through Canada. It goes by Halifax and Gander and over by Shannon. And it gives me the ability to get that same type of representation that I used on the globe. Lambert conformal projections are limited in scope, though. You can't do the whole world. That's why a globe was always very helpful for us. Here we see a Jepson representation of a Lambert conformal plotting chart. Uh, this is one that many of us use. Uh, if we depart from New York and go to London, it gives us the Great Circle route. There's, there's no track on here. There's no airways or anything. But if we were to do that, we would go just north of Halifax, just north of Gander, almost over Shannon. And uh, many of us have done this. So you can see this would be an accurate representation of our route. So these two are paper products. 
Today, many of us use these same tools digitally. Again, using ForeFlight, you can see here I'm using a Jepson base to go from Teterboro to Luton, and it gives me exactly the same Lambert projection, so it would be accurate. Here is the FAA oceanic planning chart, again in four flight. Um, that's one of the advantages of four flight. You have various uh, base layers you can use, and I, I simply prefer this, but it's a little less cluttered, and it gives us exactly the same representation. So there's a lot of ways you can do this. We're just trying to um, kind of walk you through the various maps that you can perform this function, this great circle route. Now let's take a dive into some of the really important details that give us the insight that we require. Here I've taken the FAA planning chart, I've drilled down, and I have two oceanic waypoints that are uh, separated by 10 degrees longitude to standard separation, as we mentioned. And on the left, it's 5-3 north, and on the right, it's 5-4 north. And that's the Great Circle route, because this is a Lambert conformal map. But that's not exactly how your airplane flies it. It flies a dead reckon around that route, and it, it's constantly changing. And this was actually the point that was brought up by our um, question, the subject matter expert there, that it, it, it was a changing value and that you need to understand where you are capturing that data. And that's what we're going to spend just a minute doing. We would depart on that segment on a MAC course of 097.5. That may be kind of meaninglessly accurate, but as you can see in the red line, it would change along that route of flight. Now, that's the departure point, and that could be called, as it would in the track and distance table, the initial track. It's corrected for MAC variation because we put that in there, but it's the initial point. As we continue through that flight and we progress along through the uh, course, we would approach the waypoint and the MAC course would be approximately 103.5. Again, insanely accurate, but it's changing all along that route of flight. Somewhere along the route, you're going to find your mid-course, and it's shown on the electronic flight bag E6B as 101.5, and the midpoint would be the point at which you're going to have that halfway mag course. Now, the whole reason to having this discussion is because flight plan formats come in two different manners. Some flight plan formats will show the crew the midpoint, and some flight plan formats will show the crew the initial. And we want to use the initial in this illustration because that's what our flight plan format is, and that's what the Jepson General Airway track and distance tables are. There are other track and distance tables for midpoint. ATI had midpoint track and distance tables. So we, it's important to know the difference. So let's just uh, take a look at two flight plan formats to show that. Here we see a format, and the designation of the waypoints could vary. It's really not particularly important, but in this case, it's showing the uh, Airing 424 designation for the waypoints. And that is helpful for the crew because that's what would be illustrated on their FMS. And when you go from 53 North 050 West to 54 North 040 West, almost every format I've ever seen will take you down to the departure point mag course, in this case highlighted in yellow and shown by the blue arrow, as 098. Now 098 is that point I've circled on the chart in blue as well. We're going to depart that point at 098 and we're going to go 363 miles. That matches the E6B that we saw there. So when I do a mag course and distance check with this flight plan format, my FMS says I'm going from this air rank code to this air rank code on a 098, I'm probably going to be within plus or minus 2 degrees, maybe 3, on some rare cases, maybe 4. That is how some flight plan formats are done. The flight plan format we're going to use for our illustration will be done in a similar fashion, but that's not the only way that it could be calculated. Here we see a different flight plan format. 
This particular design includes the waypoints as they would be stated in ICAO phraseology in voice communication. And when we depart 53 North 050 West and go to 54 North 040 West, it doesn't show 098. It shows 101. And if you go back over to the E6B that we see, that would be the midpoint. And I've circled the midpoint in blue with a circle uh, on that um, great circle route. So you can see this format is different. If you were to use this format and you were to take a look at our flight um, planning track and distance tables, there would be a built-in three degree difference and it could be more than three degrees or less than three degrees depending upon the leg, but there'd be a built-in difference in addition to the static error, which could be two to three degrees. So in some instances, you could see four or five, maybe even six degrees of error if you're using mid-course. There's not a problem with a midpoint mag course, but there would be a problem if you didn't understand it and appreciate how it affects your mag course and distance validation and the selection of a track and distance table that was compatible for your particular flight plan format. That's a lot to digest. So what I'm going to do in just a couple of brief moments is I'm going to show you how the Jepson track and distance tables can be applied, how they'd be utilized, and then we're going to return to our example, um, that reroute that we had, and we'll go ahead and, and, and figure out what the appropriate answer would and show you how that would be calculated. This shows the Pacific. This is an area just south of the Aleutian Islands. If you look up above, you see Dutch Harbor and Coal Bay and things of that nature. And this is a route of flight that goes from 49 North 150 West to 50 North 160 West. It's westbound and it's in the North Pacific. And we're going to use the track and distance tables that Jepson provides us to determine the MAC course and distance. Now, the point here is all I need to do is go from latitude to latitude as long as the default is 10 degrees of longitude. So this is going, you know, from 150 west to 160 west. So that's 10 degrees of longitude. And it doesn't matter if I'm going east or west. It doesn't matter if I'm going in the Pacific or the North Atlantic. The chart will perform that function for me. The chart will give me the initial true track. In order to get the mag course, I'm going to need the mag variation. And this is real important. I need the mag variation from the departure point. It said that in the advisory circular. It also said that in the Jepson chart. So that is consistently mentioned in the defaults for the documents. So I've chosen to use ForeFlight to simply select the waypoint 49 North 050 West, that's, or 150 West. That's the waypoint that I'm departing from as I go westbound. And it shows that the mag variation is 14 degrees east. Do you remember there's a rhyme? East is least and west is best. So that's real important to know what the mag variation is so that I know how to apply it to the initial true track. Now let's take a look at the Jepson track and distance tables. What I'm showing you here at the top is the default. It is the northern hemisphere. That's the only place that these track and distance tables work. It is the initial true track, which we've consistently discussed, and it's for 10 degrees change in longitude, which we've consistently discussed. What I need to do is I'm going to go from a latitude to a latitude. I'm departing from 49 north. That's my latitude. So I'm going to find 49 north where it says latitude on the from column. And I'm going to 50 north, again, from a latitude to a latitude. And that identifies my leg. Next, what I'll do is I'll look at the distance. The distance between those two is 395 miles. It doesn't matter if I'm going eastbound or westbound. The distance is 395 miles. So for the track and distance, there you have the distance. Now, if you recall from the example, we're going westbound. So we're looking at true track westbound, and it's 282 degrees. So now we have true track and distance, but we need to use the mag variation to correct it. Westbound for 282 true track, we have an initial mag variation of 14 degrees east. 
Now, I'm, I'm going west, but the variation's east. East is least. So I take 282 and I subtract 14 degrees because it's east and east is least. And I get 268 degrees. That's my mag course and 395. That's my mileage. So I use this page, page 822, and I use the column that's from 49 north to 50 north, and I derive 268 and 395, and I get my mag course and distance. So that's the Pacific. For the purposes of illustration, I'm moving you to the North Atlantic. In this illustration, we are also going from 49 north, 040 west, to 50 north, 030 west, and this will be a eastbound route. So now I'm in the North Atlantic, and I'm headed eastbound. I take the mag variation from the departure point, and since I'm headed eastbound, the departure point is 49 north, 040 west, and the mag variation is 15 degrees west. Previously, it was east, and east is least. Now it's west, and west is best. I think you can see where I'm going with this. Even though we're in the North Atlantic now, we're going to return to the same chart because we're in the Northern Hemisphere, and we're going from 49 north to 50 north, the latitude to latitude. We're just doing it in a different part of the Northern Hemisphere in a different direction. The mileage will be the same. 395 miles. Now we're going eastbound instead of westbound. And this will make the course, uh, the true track, 077. That's our true track. Our mag variation, if you recall, was now westbound. It was 15 degrees west. And to apply that, we take the 077 and west is best. So we add that and we end up with a 092 for 395 miles. We've used this same line in both the North Atlantic and in the Pacific because it doesn't care about longitude. It only cares about latitude. We go from latitude to latitude. We can go east or west. Remember, this is the default. It's Northern Hemisphere. It's the initial true track, and it's for a 10-degree change in longitude. Now, I mentioned that 10-degree change in longitude, and I had previously mentioned this because when we operate a jet aircraft, we can accomplish 10-degree longitude legs in sufficient time that we can use those for our transit of oceanic airspace and, and jet aircraft. So when you cross the North Atlantic, your waypoints are traditionally based on 050 degrees longitude, 040 degrees longitude, 0302. So here you have the classic illustration of the longitudes that define the waypoints in the North Atlantic. Many of the routes in the Pacific will be based on the same 10 degrees separation. There are reasons and occasions when that's not true, but there are exceptions. There are various ways to get the mag variation. The first I'm going to show you is the simplest. If you just go to ForeFlight and you select a waypoint, as we've done here, ForeFlight will identify the mag variation for that waypoint based on what it believes are its current tables. There are other ways that this can be accomplished. If you have a Jepson plotting chart, the Jepson plotting charts have what are referred to as isogonic lines, which often are referred to as the mag variation lines. And on this North Atlantic chart, you can see the isogonic lines, and I've identified them as 20 degrees west, 16, 12, and 8. They are identified on the chart, but only in the North Atlantic on the seams. You'd have to go up to the top of the chart and find where that line departs the seam, and it would identify that um, isogonic line value. When you're between the isogonic lines, let's just say, for example, that you had a waypoint of um, uh, 48 north, 050 west, that's about halfway between the 20 and the 16, so you'd interpolate that and make 18. So you can use a plotting chart to get the isogonic line and derive the mag variation, or you can use something like Jepson, and either will work. 
they may not have the same update cycle and they may vary and that's important but they're not going to vary significantly so they won't affect your outcome now that we've done the deep dive now that we've looked at the great circle route and we've looked at the departure point um, and we've looked at the midpoint this flight plan format, returning to our previous example and our reroute, this flight plan format shows at the top in red mag course and distance. I've highlighted them there so you can see where they would lie in the body of the flight plan. And then when I go down into the new waypoints, I've drawn red lines through them because they need to be corrected. And these would represent the departure point, the initial course the initial mag course, the initial true course. So that's how this format is set up. It matches what Jepson's doing. So we're going to get pretty close on this. Returning to our example, going to the true track tables, we were going to depart from 53 north 030 west and go to 55 north 020 west. So the latitudes are 53 north to 55 north. We don't care about the longitudes. They're 10 degrees apart. That's part of the default. The distance is 373 miles. And I'm going eastbound, so my new true track will be 067. I'm going to need to take that true track, and I'm going to need to correct it for mag variation. So I need to get the mag variation for 53 north 030 west. We saw this previously just a moment ago, and I take the iPad and I select that in four flight and it gives me 12 degrees west for the mag variation. Again, that's the departure point. We keep the initial course, the departure course. So we take that mag variation, 12 degrees west. West is best. So we have a 067 true track and a 079 mag course. West is best. So we add 12 to 67, get 079 for 373 miles. That's what we would place on the flight plan if we were using the track and distance tables to accomplish this reroute in the North Atlantic. This is what you could be asked to demonstrate in a validation. Returning to the master document, I simply write in 079 for 373. And then I look at the MCDU, the FMS, and I confirm that it is within two or three degrees and within two miles. The next leg involves an oceanic exit point. That oceanic exit point is Resno, and we're going to go from 55 north 020 west to Resno. So we're going to depart 55 north and go to Resno. And this table constructs a little bit different. You know, the distance line is on the far right column instead of in the center, but that shouldn't really be confusing. The distance is 173 miles, and the eastbound true track would be 88. With that 88, we're going to need to determine what the mag variation is at the departure point. The departure point's 55 north, 020 west. We return to four flight. We select 55 north 020 west and we identify the mag variation as 9 degrees west. West is best, so we take 088 and uh, take the mag variation of 9 west and we have 097 for 173. This would be used to make that track and distance calculation in a validation and we would take it and place it on our master document as we previously did. And here we simply, again, write in the value from the track and distance table and confirm that the FMS matches it. It's within one degree, and it is on the mileage. It could be, uh, remember, two or three degrees, maybe four, and then it could be within two miles, and that would represent accuracy. And this is the completion of the exercises you might be asked to do it on a validation. It's the ultimate backup. It's what you've got in Jepson, and, and you could do this. So there were three ways that we could accomplish this confirmation. We could get a new flight plan. We could use an onboard flight planning tool like ForeFlight, or we could use the track and distance tables to compute this. And that was what was brought up in the last webcast. So now we've walked through this, we've taken a deep dive, and we've come up with each of these methods and how they would be executed. 
We're going to close the topic by returning to Advisory Circular 9170 Bravo on Oceanic Operations, and we're going to address another question that came up in the last webcast, and it kind of puts a bow on what we've been talking about here, and that's Appendix A. And Appendix A talks about the journey logbook and the master document. Now, the question in the last webcast was, um, what are the contents of the journal logbook? They're not listed here, but this gives us at least a little bit of information. It, in, a, in another section of the advisory circle, it lists the content. The journey logbook is a record of the flight operation. It, it should be retained for six months. There's a number of things that could be involved in this. It, you could have a single form for journey log, or you could use the maintenance log, the trip sheet, the general deck, and the master document. Now, the master document is defined next. That's a copy of the operational flight plan labeled as a master on that copy, because remember, there could be two or three copies of that on the flight deck, which currently effective route clearance is recorded. Not the packet that they sent you, but the clearance. So if the clearance were amended, you would reflect that amended clearance. And it would define the route, the track, and the distance between each waypoint. So if it were amended and it had to be updated, it would include an update of the track and distance between each waypoint along the cleared track. And that would be retained for six months as well. So that brings us full circle back to um, why we do these things, what the resources are within them, and this uh, places us in a, a good spot to move to questions. Now, Joe, if you'll start the questions, we will try to uh, see what we can do with what some of these smart. All right, that's what we'll do. Folks have to ask. So let me uh, pull up this last, well, no, I have another poll. We're just going to go straight to the questions. And I apologize, I did not get my camera back on there. All right. Well, I saw that we had a couple of questions and Mitch answered uh, those as we went. So um, I'll open up the floor. If you have any other questions, feel free, uh, type them in. One question Mitch uh, answered already, uh, updating the wrong line on the flight plan. Um, it, that what we were pointing out there is, I don't know if Mitch, you want to pull it up or not, but uh, the flight plan format that the, what we were showing it's it's organized in such a way that the you know the 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 to and from waypoints the 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 data for it is at the at the two waypoint line, not the from waypoint line. So that's why it was was looking like that. It yeah, was appearing. That he was, it's simply a matter of what kind of format. Yeah, and we yeah. tried to identify that. And Chris had a question um, about why did I have to switch charts, and I'm which, unclear yeah. about that. Maybe Joe, do you? Does that make um, am I, what I'm not say? sure which chart Chris was referring to when he wrote the question. That was my, so Chris, okay. if you don't mind typing in, let us know what it is that you specify, if you could specify what you mean by that. I'm not sure if he's still with us. I'll then stop sharing that one and then uh, I'll, I'll pull up the slides just to see which slide it is that he's referring to. Yeah, and um, if you Joe, if you go to slide forty, yep, um, slide forty shows the format, which is what uh, Aaron was asking about. All right, let me pull up. Uh, now I'm in the. Let me grab this one. There we go. So that's what I'm seeing is slide forty. Oh, okay, okay, and see if you run the arrow, the arrow will go down. Um, I have in at least my limited experience in flying always used a format like this. Uh, Joe, if you could animate that, it'll it'll show the lines as it goes through. It, they always go down from to that point. And maybe by, let me ask you this, um, by a raise of hands, who has a format that doesn't do this? And I'll pull okay, up a so different... We do have some sure. folks that have a format that goes straight across. And um, that's so obviously not something that is out of the realm of possible. It's just um, I'm seeing three raised hands out of 187 people, four raised hands out of 187 people. The overwhelming majority are going to have that format that I showed you there. That's, that's okay. what 
was referring to. And then Chris has a very good question. He says, well, you, when you went from 5.5 north to Resno, you seem to use a different chart. And I did, and that was the page that had the oceanic exit point. Any entry or exit point will be based on a, a track and distance chart that appears different. If it's 10 degrees to 10 degrees, as you see here, that's a standard Northern Hemisphere 10 degree chart. But if you're going to exit or enter, then you're probably not going to have 10 degrees of separation. So they make a unique chart for those that um, uh, have that capability. So Joe, if you were to go down and, and pick up the one that where Resno was, I'm not sure what slide that is, that would show that. Is and that I apologize. The um, yeah, that, that's the one there. That, and you can see that as a different. And, and what it does is it lists that as a North Atlantic only because they're the only ones that have defined entry and exit waypoints. It's a good question, Chris. Excellent and I'm question. sorry, it uh, took me a moment to pick that up. Um, so, Chris, I see you said, I'm trying to word this better. Two different tables and codes pages. You, you added extra comments for us. One that has 10 degrees in the title. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So I think, I think this answered your questions. So yeah. uh, excellent. I appreciate you pointing that out for us, Chris, because that is an excellent a point to make, as Mitch just explained to you guys, that uh, the tables are slightly different depending on, you know, what you're, where you are exactly, what oceanic region you're in, you can use the different table. All right. Um, Let's go to the one someone, Dave brought. And then Dave, I'm going to skip that one. I'll answer live. Now I'll go down to David. David asks, David Malloy asks, or statement only, actually. Statement only. We recommend that the crew have only one copy of the flight plan in the cockpit and that it be used as the master flight plan. We've seen cases where the crew had more than one flight plan in the cockpit and led to an oceanic error. So, excellent. Thank you very much for that, David. And, and that does go ahead. Dave is the individual who uh, spurred this conversation in the last webcast, and I mentioned is uh, really the expert in this. He's got more experience than anybody. He worked on the Oceanic Scrutiny Group who um, was tracking this, and he's seen how all these things work, and uh, it's, it's excellent input. And we try to cover that in our initial, how important it is to not mix flight plans, because you might you know pick up a flight plan, leave in Istanbul, get an updated one uh, at the hotel hotel, get one in the ground in Luton, and you need to have one and use one. And that's that's the method uh, to, to reduce air. And something that we'd also seen in the past, a, a, a comment from clients actually was a, a question was asking how to manipulate it if he did print out a new plan. If you did the option of printing out a new flight plan that you received from your dispatch or your, your flight plan provider, in that case, you would definitely want to mark the new one as the current master and then put some mark on the old one as the old master or mark it as old. And then that's when you can do, as David indicates, and just get it out of the cockpit. <clears throat> All right. Jeremy says, just a comment. Uh, I use my iPhone and snap a pic of the amended clearance and we save it. That's, that's a good technique. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jeremy, uh, interestingly enough, the reason I got into teaching international procedures was that a friend of mine, Ed, and I were taking a whole bunch of pictures on an iPhone of clearances and everything going on in the cockpit. And I was attending a class with Dave Store, and we were talking about some stuff, and I showed him all these pictures. And that began a relationship with Dave Store and ATI, where we started building courseware. Uh, because we knew what was happening in the cockpit. Uh, so it's an excellent point. Uh, very near and dear to my heart. Um, a picture's worth a thousand words. Absolutely. Kim asks, what if the reroute involves half waypoints, half degree waypoints? Uh, how would the distance and course uh, distance and course be recalculated? using uh, half degree. Um, Joe, if you'll go back to the previous slide, uh, half degree waypoints are incorporated into the track and distance tables. Look at, uh, you see just above 49 North 50 North is 49 North 5030 North. So the Jepson construct has the half degree waypoints in it and it could be utilized in the same manner. It's a great question, Kim. Mm -hmm. Excellent question. All right, I 
get halfway points. We've answered that one. All right. Now, um, Harold says, I used to do it everything manually on a Challenger 604 with the printed master copy. All right. So it, it basically, Harold, I appreciate the comment. You're saying that everything used to be done paper and it worked fine for you. Is, yeah, I think you're going with. Yep. <clears throat> so thank you for that. Yeah, it, it does. It's It was proven. Been around for a long time, waiting for the iPads. Uh, what, uh, let's see, was your example of an electronic E6B calculator from an actual product? It was. It's a product called Flyby E6B. And Flyby E6B is an awesome E6B. It's an iPad app, an iPhone app. And we had permission to use that in training. Um, before ForeFlight created this wonderful, simple platform to do what we do, we used Flyby E6B initially in the training, and uh, it was very, very helpful. Um, so you can fly by E6B. Excellent. Good question. Thank you very much. All right. Ed, and those Ed, are, the are you going to um, open up your mic I and say hi? I'm, I opened it up for him. I apologize. I didn't realize it was going to put his camera up there too, uh, but I opened it up That's for okay. Ed just in case, in case Ed had some kind of input he wanted to make. Oh, actually, I did not, but I will say <laughs> hi. <laughs> Hello. Thanks, Ed. Okay. And this, is a, this is a good point. Time to make a couple of quick points. Um, one, we've had emails about PBN and uh, the additional codes that are identified in USAIP and the USAIM. And we have talked to the FAA, been in a recent meeting with them, and uh, there is some conflicting information. It is domestic filings, and we are going to do a webcast and address that, and Ed is going to be part of that. And we're going to discuss the importance of flight plan filing codes, how they're changing, but really mostly about international stuff instead of the new changes. We will identify the new changes. But um, the second point I wanted to make is Ed and I flew together. For many years and um he has been part of the ati effort from the very beginning he was uh, part of the validation of the courseware he was the common sense guy he sourced a lot of material for us and he'll be joining the webcast in the future and he'll be um joining joe and i as uh, we do this and you if you email us you may interact with ed so just know that he is uh been a member of this team for a really long time and he's just taken on a little bit different role. And just one uh, point to note uh, for the next webinar, um, if you go to Mitch's site and hit uh, resources, then down under ICAO, uh, there's a flight plan decoder that has uh, the updates uh, as they currently stand with the new uh, domestic filing. Um, and we'll be exploring that for the next webinar i appreciate that and, and that's been there for some time and it's gotten better and it's gotten better and it's 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 gotten even more important to be honest with you um and it's it's something that i tried to address in ioc and and uh, wasn't a real warm uh warmly received suggestion so we're going to do that here yeah, to address that. the flight plan codes and uh also just in a closing note um Ed's a lot smarter than I am. Uh, I was always, uh, I was always learning from Ed, and I expect that we're all going to do a lot of learning as uh, the next year, year and a half, two years comes around. So, well, thanks, appreciate it. And well, thank you for being part thank of this. All. And um, I just got one last question here. It just popped up. Could the next webinar include a review of the process for updating the errant plotting chart with the reroutes we just discussed? And I think maybe the air ink mm. uh, webcast we have on our website on our YouTube channel already has that information in it. Do they, did they cover reroutes? They did in the first one. And um, yeah. I am going to <clears throat> suggest that would be a great topic, but we've already done two air ink webcasts and we have two different topics. I love it when we get topics from people, the flight plan format is something that was brought to the table by somebody else and it's very very important and then we're going to have another one so we've already got two in the um development stage we're going to have one on 
the foreflight tools that can help you with oceanic operations because uh, we have seen confusion or a lot of questions about that. And again, um, I'm not the expert on it. So we're gonna have an expert come in and talk about some of the stuff that ForeFlight can help us do better in oceanic operations, because it wasn't originally intended for that, um, but it has been developed so that it can fulfill many of the tasks that we are associating with it. So um, those are what we believe will be the next two barring some sort of regulatory compliance change that we're not currently aware of. Excellent. Well, Stephen and Jody, thank you both. That was the last two comments that we had there, and uh, I think see no more other no more open questions. So, I do appreciate you guys for attending this. Uh, thank you for your your patience and your 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 questions. And again, you can always reach out to us, team at thirtywestip.com, if you have additional questions. And Keith just asked a question: Is it possible oh, to did. integrate Plot NG in with your four flight presentation? And to be honest with you, that's the guy who's going to present it is Don Argentar, who is the creator of Plot NG. So he will lightly mention Plot NG, but he is the expert on it. And um, you can ask him plenty of questions about that. So see, there I was going to say, so please show up and be ready to ask him those questions. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you, guys. Val, thank, good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you to much. everybody. Appreciate it. You guys enjoy the rest of your day and, and have a safe and happy new year.